Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing so far? I've had a fun day. Yes, I see some response. That's nice. It's always good. Um, we're here today on a Flock Community Day. You've all been sitting in an office. You've been taken care of by one of our office heroes, hopefully. If not, you can blame me, I guess. Um, what we do here at Flock Community is we organize these kind of days to uh, give you basically a workspace, to get out of your common environment to sit in a different place, be, be close to other engineers that are either doing similar things or completely different things. There was lunch, that's nice, uh, you get to get inspired by other people and right now we're at the main event of the day which is going to be the talk and I brought my good friend Tim with me from uh, SRM and he's gonna tell us all about cybersecurity, things like the threat, incident response and all those kind of things. So let's give him a warm, <laughs> so let's give him a warm welcome and uh, let's get it kicking. Thank you very much. Warm introduction. I uh, don't know how I can follow that. Uh, unfortunately, this is going to be in English. So if you were looking forward to a Dutch presentation, you will be disappointed from this point onwards. Uh, my Dutch is terrible, but I am learning. So hopefully if we do this, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> in a year from now, maybe I'll throw some Dutch words in there. Um, so if you can take out your phones or devices, fingers crossed, you've got access to spaces, internet. If you can do me a favor and log into Slido, which will be the interactive polling app for today. Uh, so what I'm basically doing here is uh, getting away with making you do the work for me. Uh, that's how I do presentations. So um, while you scan that, the QR code is conveniently on the next slide. So I can keep talking while you do it. The sales team won't really let me get past this point with at least telling you that SRM is a global intelligence and cybersecurity company. If you don't know about us, we do lots of intelligence stuff, mergers and acquis acquisitions, investigations into people, etc. cetera. Um, and we do cybersecurity stuff as well. Incident response, pen testing, pretty much anything that you can imagine is involved in cyber, we do it. And of course, we've won a lot of stuff blah, 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 you know, sales need to have those logos on the bottom of the slide, but I'm not going to bore you with that. Is anyone having any issues getting access to it? Wow, what a technically competent bunch of people. Okay, <laughs> starting off with a little bit of a view of what we're seeing. So two graphs, I tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, the data in the bottom left, I should probably put that in the top left, represents the incidence over time across three years. The data should be relatively easy to digest. The line for 2021 is in orange, the line for 2022 is in red, and the line for last year is in dark blue, which kind of looks black from here. But anyway, the point that you should be able to see here is that last year did not represent a decrease, a flattening off, tempering of incidents, no, in fact, last year was our record for uh, ransomware and data extortion incidents globally. Uh, we saw around 4,500 incidents that are publicly known. However, this is also quite important. There were a lot of clients that we had that were a victim of ransomware or data theft. They didn't pay a ransom, but they never appeared on the sites where people get their data from. And so we have what we call the iceberg effect, which is you know of the incidents that were published on these leak sites, but it's this which is in fact much larger. So we have a 62% rate of clients not appearing on a leak site, even if they don't pay a ransom, which is actually something that not many people speak about in the industry, whether this means they're keeping the data for something else, mining it potentially for, for state interests, or they just simply can't be bothered. They move on to the next victim. But the important bit is we believe there are around 12,500 attacks last year involving data theft and or encryption. The top left is also interesting for us. It kind of shows that there is a movement to less payments of ransoms. Good, except the volume has increased so much that they've still earned more money. Um, this is a big problem for us. Yes, they're paying in less proportion of incidents, but as incidents continue to go up, they went from earning $675 million last year to $1.1 billion. So 2022, 675, and last year, $1.1 billion. So unfortunately, the trend is very much up. 
So a quick comment on the drivers. So there are four, really, that we're looking at at the moment. The first one is the intractable one, geopolitical tensions. I don't need to tell people living in the Netherlands that there are some issues with Russia. Who knew over the last few years? Um, it has to just be acknowledged that ransomware, Russian-speaking ransomware groups based in Russia are doing so based on the tacit consent of the state. There is a reason no one gets arrested unless they make a mistake and hit a Russian entity. There is a reason why I just had a UK breach where they were distilling some vodka in Russia and I made that very clear to the group and I got a free decryptor within 35 minutes. Well, they don't want to piss off the people who are going to knock down their front door. So as long as we are in this position where Russia looks at these groups and says, this is a weapon that I don't need to pay for, I don't need to invest in, and I don't need to control, but I can let it do its job. As long as that is of value to Russia, we're not going to make much, um, much significant impact on their operations. So can I get a show of hands of who is aware of the Lockbit takedown? One, two, maybe 10. OK, so essentially law enforcement interrupted the largest ransomware group on the planet a week and a half ago. Um, as of, I think it was Saturday night, infrastructure was back, the attacks were happening in the background again, and the encryptor was being deployed, a new one, uh, and ransom notes were pointing victims to a new leak site. Even though we'd had a law enforcement takedown, what can you do if all you're doing is knocking down infrastructure? They live in a place you cannot arrest them in, and so what do they do? What most good companies with protected backups do, they just spin up a new bit of infrastructure and on they go. The only real damage has been to the reputation of their brand, but there are far many other brands the employees can go to. The second one is software vulnerabilities. So this really we saw throughout 2023. They are investing massive amounts of capital in research for vulnerabilities. You can imagine the idea of making tricking you and tricking you and tricking you into clicking a phishing link is far less valuable than figuring out a vulnerability in, say, Go Anywhere MFT software, and then you hit absolutely everyone with it. Um, and so we're seeing massive investment in software vulnerability research. They're literally hiring teams of software devs to unpack uh, and reverse analyze things like MoveIt, uh, Excellian software, Kaseya, et cetera, which have resulted in a lot of supply chain breaches. The third is what we just call as a service. And the point here is a reduced barrier to entry. So now if you go on the dark web, you can buy phishing as a service kit for $100 a month. And what it does is it bypasses MFA. So you have an MFA, you enter your credentials. This service essentially sits between you and Microsoft. We call it adversary in the middle phishing. And so you enter your username and password. It sends that to Microsoft. Microsoft goes, yeah, that, that makes sense. Sends you a request from an MFA code. You enter your code in what looks to be a legitimate portal, but they are in the middle. And so they get your code. They send it to Microsoft. Microsoft goes, yep, correct code, and sends you back a cookie, which says, log in. But they are still in the middle. And so they take your cookie, inject it into the browser, and they've logged in as you. Very similar to what they're doing with Citrix. What the point really of as a service is, is that you don't need to be a good hacker anymore. You can get phishing kits, ransomware kits, Trojan kits, and you don't need to know how to code. Quite concerning and very, very cheap. Um, pretty much any of these actors can afford 100 uh, a month. And then our adversary in the mid middle phishing is quite interesting just because of how many people rely on MFA uh, as a defense mechanism. But now it's over to you. So I'm going to ask you, what types of threat actors do you think we encounter when we're doing incident response? What do you think comes across our desk? And this is a, an open word cloud, so feel free to throw out any sort of monikers, names, references, types that you're aware of, and we'll go through some of the common ones that we encounter. Five people are running into it. Eight. Hacker kids, Russians, yeah.
Okay, we are almost at most of the, the key types. Flock. <laughs> 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 ah, goodness, those flock guys, yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we can move on at this point. So we've got fishing and state actors as some of the largest. State-backed actors has suddenly become even bigger. Um, to be honest, state-backed actors are probably the least that we see in our day-to-day -day job. We, ha we do encounter nation state actors. We had one in Hong Kong recently where uh, one of our ITMSP clients was, was hacked by what we believe to be a, a Chinese state-backed agency. Uh, they did it to try and essentially conduct espionage on all of the downstream clients of the ITMSP. So it was a very quiet attack. But generally, we don't see them. Now, is that because they're not doing that much or is it because we don't see them? I think it's probably because we just don't see them. As you saw with Midnight Blizzard, the Russians who got into Microsoft, typically you only know about them when they've decided they're going to do an attack, which is relatively clear. Um, to be honest, most of the time we are actually encountering someone who's not really here, which is the ransomware groups, the, the financially backed groups. That's all they're there for, is to get money and get more money and keep getting more money. However, the links between some of these financially motivated groups and state-backed actors is controversial, interesting. Um, Lockbit, for example, has a couple of people working for them who we know for a fact were asked by Russian intelligence to steal data on Alexei Navalny, who is now dead. He was killed in, or, or died in prison. Killed or died, depends on, on your attribution of ma malicious intent to the Russian government. I'm quite controversial in that regard. So we see ransomware as a service groups the most. That is the bread and butter of SRM. These are the people that we unfortunately find ourselves speaking with at ridiculous hours of, of, of the night as we try to, to assist our clients. Um, BEC gangs is really interesting. So BEC refers to business email compromise. There's a, quite a shocking statistic that more fraud is in fact conducted by business email compromise gangs in places like Nigeria than by ransomware groups. So ransomware, the impact of ransomware on the global economy is considered to be much, much, much more considerable than these guys who get in your mailbox. But in fact, the direct economic out fallout from them you know, redirecting invoices, changing banking details, that kind of thing is actually a higher economic impact than ransomware for now. And then I've, as I've mentioned, APT is pretty rare. And you know, we do come across the script kiddies, the script kids, as some people refer to them. Gray hats are quite interesting. So they'll approach you and say, yeah, we, we, uh, we have your customer record database. Um, pay us $50,000. And they're like, you're conducting criminal activity. And they'll say, no, 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 no. I'm doing bug bounty. It's a bug bounty, I promise. It's like, no, 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 this is illegal. And then they'll say, no, it's a bug bounty. I, I don't do illegal activity. So, Slightly odd area that, and then you've got your hacktivists, so anonymous, and we're seeing a lot of activity pro Gaza at the moment um, in, that, in that space. Right, but you've got to find a target. So now you're gonna essentially step into the shoes of the threat, so thinking like the threat. It's 29th of February, today, leap year. So this scenario is only good for, for this year. Um, you're the lead initial access specialist. So you are essentially an individual in a major ransomware group, and you're being asked to find the target for an incident. So how do you find your next target? You've got a few options that your boss has suggested to you because you were like, I got no idea. The boss has said you could scan the whole internet for vulnerable Microsoft on-premise exchange software. You could launch a global phishing campaign focused on the fact that it's a leap year. You could look for network credentials, which are available to purchase on the dark web. You could create what we call a watering hole lure, or a drive-by compromise, where you infect a website and wait for someone to come on the infected website, and when they do, they're infected. Or you could scan the whole internet for vulnerable ConnectWise Screen Connect software. So another different software scanning exercise. Three brave folks have jumped in with their ranking. I'll wait for that to get to about 10, and then we can jump in.
All right, we are at 10, but five participants are typing. I feel slightly bad, but anyway, let's jump in. Um, so what I am actually quite happy to see is that there's a rough equal choice across the board. The ultimate point being is that you don't typically choose a specific target. You are just hitting the internet. Whether you choose to go for scanning the whole internet for Screen Connect, this is what I would choose if it was today, because I said on the 29th of February, and 29th of February, Microsoft on-premise exchange, wherever you are, Mr. Number Third, is no longer really relevant because there are no current issues in Microsoft on-premise exchange which are being actively exploited. But this one, wherever you are, Screen Connect, is the flavor of the month for all ransomware groups. It is being absolutely hammered right now because the, the zero days in its software are, in my opinion, childishly easy to exploit. Um, the person who found it managed to create an exploit in three and a half hours. Um, that's never a good sign. Most of you have voted for credentials to purchase on the dark web. Really good option. Most ransomware groups will have uh, a marketplace or an individual that they go to and they buy from. Uh, in fact, we had a case recently where uh, we had uh, a third party who had hacked the broker, the initial access broker, and we could see the requests coming from these big ransomware groups. Oh, can you give us some credentials for Citrix? And then he hands them over. Um, so that's a really good choice as well. I think the one that's probably least likely is the watering hole lure. It's an absolutely great attack though. What happens is it checks what you're typing for in Google and then invents a PDF of relevance. So let's say you're typing um, uh, financial accounting how to Uruguay it will create a PDF which is named roughly along those lines on a compromised website. Once you click it, you install Gootloader, the uh, Trojan, uh, in the background, and then that immediately contacts them saying, we're in. So this is um, our graph for last year. The writing is tiny, apologies. Um, essentially, by far the largest we had last season, last season, last year in 2023 were external remote services. Now, what that really covers, it's pretty vague. VPNs, remote access services, team viewer, screen connect, things like this. But what it means is they got access legitimately. They didn't exploit something. That's the second largest. So by far the biggest source of compromise last year were people just taking VPN credentials and logging directly into a network. No major attack, nothing complicated, just insecure use of VPNs. The second largest is this exploit public facing application. So this is your Citrix, this is your Microsoft Exchange, Screen Connect, Fortigate, uh, what other massive ones have there been? Sonic Wall in July was a, was a big one for us. But this is where they've invested significantly. This was 10% in 2022, and yet you can see it, it, it's more than a quarter at this point. And then there's a couple of others. I don't know if you'd be surprised that phishing is one of the smallest that we see in 2023. Yes, everyone goes, gosh, cybersecurity training, don't click links. It's the right thing. They're not lying. But we just don't see it result in many incidents anymore. Most of the phishing threat actors that used to work with ransomware groups no longer exist. So Emotet, Quackbot, etc., they don't exist. So the, the threat has changed there considerably. All right. So you've decided to exploit Screen Connect and you've essentially got access. Now you're in a network, but the boss wants you to make sure that your foothold within the network maintains, is, is, is persistent. So what do you choose to do next to advance the attack? You've got some options. You can run Mimikatz, which is a credential stealer. So do you want to run a bit of malware which steals some credentials from the server? Do you want to delete the user accounts in Screen Connect? You're on a Screen Connect server, so this is possible. Do you want to map the network? So you run a network recon tool to map out what you can see. Do you want to call the IT team and complain about an issue in Screen Connect, convincing them to access the server, which leaves their domain admin creds in memory for you? Do you want to tell your boss this is actually way too hard and you want to request a transfer to the crypto laundering team? much easier part of being part of a ransomware group. Or do you want to check if your account is a local admin or not? 
to be honest, there's not a right answer here. And a lot of you will probably be thinking that. This is about a choice. It's a difficult one, so I'll, maybe I'll move on quickly here. If I was part of it, I, I, I might just choose call the, uh, what's it? Check if the account is local admin 25. Map the network connected to the server by running a network recon tool. Yep, check if local admin and not many, oh, excuse me. Not many of you have decided to quit ransomware as your job and move to the crypto laundering team. I think that would have been a valid choice. Um, yeah, so typically when we see people get access to the server, the next thing they do is map what the server is connected to at a network level. Quickly, you can figure out, am I in a DMZ, a demilitarized zone? Apologies. Does that mean you can break out? Um, only issue is, A, you might not be able to run any thing on the server because you might not, you, there might be restrictions due to local admin or not. The other thing is, is that typically network recon tools are considered now malware or they will generate alerts. And so you may want to do this first because you might want to, as local admin, use the local administration privileges on the device to then allow the rest of it to run. Because Mimikatz definitely is gonna be triggering alerts. Whether anyone is looking at the alerts is an entirely separate issue. Oh yeah, the, the, the one I'm doing now, global ransomware attack with 6,000 alerts in Defender. I don't know where to start. Um, now it's time to turn the foothold into a compromise. So essentially, you're going to want to do most of these. But checking if you're a local admin, people still make the mistake of having public facing servers where if you actually get an account, you're local admin. Bizarre. Um, you use the local admin to set an exclusion in Microsoft Defender. You basically tell the antivirus on the server, don't scan anything in the desktop folder. And then you run everything from there. You decide to run NetScan and Bloodhound as your network recon tools, very popular tools. I love them as well, not for hacking, but for identity of vulnerabilities and issues and config. And then you've got Mimikatz. Now Mimikatz is a fantastical tool developed by a French security researcher, unfortunately used for uh, the wrong types of activity, but it was designed for security researchers. Ultimately, what you use Mimikatz for is when you access a server and the server doesn't switch off, so it doesn't restart, is your credentials are stored within the memory of that device. And so what Mimikatz does is it hooks in, grabs the credentials stored in memory. It's phenomenal. But what often happens is people generate a domain admin like a service account to do all the admin related to Screen Connect. Problem is, is if that's a privileged account, you go on a Screen Connect server, you hook out the service account for Screen Connect. And most of the big incidents we have are service accounts um, which are being exploited. Now, this is an anonymized version of Bloodhound. So once you run Bloodhound, this is the type of thing you're going to see. So the, the user that was running Bloodhound can now see that there's a way to, oh, I can use remote desktop protocol. There's a session that's, a session is in progress. So you could hijack that session and get access to it. You know you can go through here to get access to the domain admins or enterprise admins. The point is, is very, very quickly using that process, you now have a pretty good idea of what you want to target. But it's time for you to move. So you're on the server, you now got access to a service account. Where do you want to go? You've got these options. You've got a corporate network in front of you, but you probably have limited time. Do you want to go to an SQL server, so a database? Do you want to go to the backup server, delete the backups? Maybe go to file server and interact with the data? Domain controller, of course, that hosts your identity system. Maybe you fancy going on some user laptops and interfering with someone's Fortnite session. <laughs> Who knows? or telephony servers if you want to be very jazzy and intercept some phone calls. At this point, people are overwhelmingly going with domain controller. This is pretty much in order of what a threat actor would do, so I do congratulate you on that. Maybe SQL server could be a little bit above user laptops. Uh, they do tend to go into the database just to check whether it's encrypted at rest, check what DBS uh, management system is in front of it. Um, 
They do like to steal entire databases if they can get away with it, but of course, that's a massive amount of traffic. Domain controller is fantastic. You get on there, you can dump the identity system, essentially, NTDS. What that allows you to do is you crack it and you get access to all of the accounts. So now you've gone from one service account to having pretty much every single account in the network. You can imagine why that's great if someone knocks out your account, you can just go use one of the ones you've just identified. The backup server, 100%, you're gonna to wanna to delete the backups. You're not gonna to wanna to do that immediately, but it's great to move there, identify what you have and figure out how you're gonna bypass it. So now you've like moved around, it's time to create a foothold. Very dramatic imagery on this slide, isn't it? So you tell your boss, Mr. Eagle, you've got access to the network, you exploited Screen Connect, you got access to a service account by running Memicats and you mapped the network using NetScan and Bloodhound. But now he wants you to establish a persistent foothold. This means that if they get in and they figure out what's going on, how are you gonna make sure you've still got these footholds across the network? This is a critical part of the attack. What do you choose to do? So you can deploy Cobalt Strike. If people know what Cobalt Strike is, it, was a, it is a pen testing kit. It's absolutely amazing. And threat actors have cracked it like any good software and they use it. You could access each device, so using RDP or something similar, and then install a credential stealer, and so every time someone enters their password and username, maybe you, you want to get that info. You could brute force the IT team's password manager, let's say they're using LastPass, and you wanna get into that so you get all of the passwords, keys to the, uh, keys to the castle. You could deploy Screen Connect from the server that you're already on, or you could tell your boss this is definitely too hard and you want to transfer to kit canteen duty. You don't even want to do crypto anymore. Yeah, I can get that. If anyone's done a pen test, it is roughly at this point in the incident where you're like, oh, all of my work was fantastic, but where do I go from here? Okay. Neck and neck between credential stealer and screen connect. So the answer from my perspective is you go for the path of least resistance and the way of making as little sound as possible. Screen Connect is a legitimate software tool that they expect to be present in your network. You have access to it. Why not just put that on every single device? Because it's not gonna trigger any antivirus. The IT teams will see Screen Connect and be like, yeah, yeah, we own that, yeah, fine. If you put a credential stealer, every single Windows Defender on each device is gonna be screaming to anyone looking at the alerts. Again, if anyone's looking at the alerts. Um, at this point, I can see quite a few more people have decided ransomware life is not for them. And I can completely understand that too. And then the last two, um, again, far too noisy. You don't wanna alert IT at all, if you can get away with it. You can't get away with it. The IT team has realized something is definitely up. They've tried to log in via Screen Connect, but you deleted all the user accounts earlier on to prevent IT from responding to the incident. You notice that essentially your, your sessions are being interrupted. So you've got RDP to one of the SQL servers and then, okay, my session's ended. You know that people are using the accounts you've got access to. Could be another threat actor, but you suspect it's IT. You have limited time indicated by that wonderful image again. <laughs> What do you decide to do? You don't need to select all of the available options, but maybe select a few that you think you'd do in the limited time you have available. You are running out of time, and don't forget, Igor is breathing down your neck. So you can admit defeat and tell Igor that you failed, ultimately. See how that goes down with their HR system. Log into the file server and try to exfiltrate the data. You could prepare to deploy ransomware to anything you do have access to. You could log into that backup server you chose to access earlier and delete or encrypt all the backups. You could delete the logs, anti-forensics. You wanna make my job really difficult, okay? Or you could establish a separate foothold and encrypt the Screen Connect server. Meaning that if IT tried to access via Screen Connect, it doesn't work. The host server that manages it is, is dead. All right. Don't have an awful lot of time, so I will skip right through. And we've got 20 votes already. You guys are on form now, the momentum is built. That's interesting, so you guys have decided that actually you want to hamstring the response 
and try to prolong the incident by limiting their attempts to access the network. Very valid option. I wouldn't do it personally myself. At this point, I think I'd just be panicking as the, as the hacker and really just trying to achieve certain objectives. What I would want to do at this point and what they're thinking about is how can they make sure that they do not leave this situation with zero money? And that typically means that they are going to encrypt any device they have access to at this point. Then they, they will accept that there will be a limited percentage they won't get access to. But they're also going to make sure that they do the file server piece first. The point of dual extortion is so that if they encrypt your devices and you recover, they have the second piece of leverage, which is the, the, the data they've stolen from you. And so typically we see a race to the file server a race to steal as much data as possible. Often we interrupt it. Often they get about a, you know, 100 plus gigs, and then you stop the flows by, by doing a deny any all at firewall level. But often you can't get there in time. Deleting logs from all devices, you guys, are, are a pain. I can't believe it. That would be the worst. Uh, most threat actors, thankfully, uh, are too busy doing other stuff. But I will not uh, claim any otherwise, a lot of threat actors do delete a lot of logs and we end up in a position where getting answers is, is a really difficult and labor intensive exercise. But you've successfully ac accessed the file server and you've decided to exfiltrate data. However, the ransomware deployment fails. You try to do it via group policy object from the domain controller, very valid option, but unfortunately it didn't work, or fortunately. Uh, and so you've manually encrypted half of the servers by going in through Screen Connect and actually deploying it yourself. Igor is happy. Yeah. So you're in a negotiation situation now. You're negotiating with the victim. They tell you pretty openly, uh, you didn't encrypt everything, buddy. You made a mistake. We actually have backups in the cloud through Acronis. And so we've just recovered our network. However, they admit you stole some data, and they don't want to see that appear on the dark web. So what do you look for inside the stolen data set? You've exfiltrated this data. It's sitting on a server that you host. What are you looking for as a, as a hacker? What do you look for? All suggestions are probably valid at this time. PII, yeah, oh wow, PII data as well. Got our GDPR friends in the room. Proof of cloud backups, interesting, yeah. Yeah, internal comms, credit cards, yep, the low hanging fruit. Compromised pictures. Interesting. <laughs> I think I'll leave that one. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. We have seen some pretty sketchy imagery emailed to CEOs. Um, a great one that often <laughs> is often uh, a cause of contention is when people put on LinkedIn that their role is not what their role is. Uh, so we had an American breach where we all of the comms go to the CEO. It wasn't the CEO. The threat actor thought it was the CEO because this individual had CEO on LinkedIn, but it turns out he was the CEO of the printing division in Massachusetts. <laughs> the real CEO was quite shocked to find this out in the crisis management calls, of course. Um, ultimately, this is correct. They do look for personal data. What they're actually more interested in, and it's not on here as far as I can see, your cyber insurance documentation. They want to know what you're covered to, and then they ask for one euro less. Makes sense. Um, they will look for any regulatory issues as well. So some regulators won't let you make an off-the-books payment of above X, then they will demand one euro less. The other bit is, of course, financial spreadsheets, which I don't think is on here. They want to see what your balance is. And so we had another one where they demanded uh, 12 million pounds. We got them down to 6 million pounds after a two-week negotiation. Um, and we told them very much up front, we cannot pay any more than that. And they just sent us a financial spreadsheet showing an available balance of 93 million. <laughs> no, sir, that's not going to work. So looking at the data is, is, is really important. 
But we have good news, not for us as the hackers, but for the world. The victim decides to walk away. Right choice. You demonstrate that you do have their financial data, their insurance documents, and you give them this file tree. It doesn't look like this. It's just a, a text file with the name of every single file they stole from your, from your environment. Ultimately, the victim looked through this and decided it's just not valuable enough. And this is what we want people to do in 2024, is if you are not encrypted, or you are encrypted and you have backups, and, and the only issue you face is the release of sensitive data, if that is the case you, you face, we will always advise do not pay, because there's far too much data out there already that is considered highly sensitive. We had a case the other day. Submarine schematics were stolen, and missile schematics were stolen. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, most sensitive data ever, terrible. Client decided not to pay, and the reg regulator closed the case within three days saying, yeah, it wasn't sensitive data. I don't think they opened the, uh, the submission, but that doesn't matter. The point is, is that ultimately the group didn't receive the multi-million pound ransom, and hopefully we made a slight dent in the, uh, in the unfortunate trend of these guys winning. So thinking about defense, really, it was a hypothetical scenario, but I think there's a couple of key points to be made. The first is around patching. We have been in a situation for decades where patching was a patch Tuesday, once a month. <coughs> you only patch things that you've tested and made sure work. Now there's a different rush. Zero days are zero days, and if you wait too long, it's too late. The Screen Connect zero day was announced on a Monday. They had an exploit by Wednesday night. We had ransomware attacks coming in by Thursday morning. Patch Tuesday is no longer a valid option for patching cadence. EDR, I mean, everyone and their dog wants to sell you EDR now. Um, there are some good ones. EDR stands for Endpoint Detection and Response. It's antivirus, but a better form of it. At this point in the arms race, if you don't have EDR, good luck. They will bypass any old antivirus you have in place. Backup protection. We always advocate for VMs 32100. Three backup mediums stored in two different medium sources. Um, and the zero, zero essentially is, I think, zero errors under testing. Um, I forget what the last zero is. But it's the 32100 model needs to be in place for effective disaster recovery. An air-gapped backup solution, a cloud backup solution, and the one that you use normally on and within the network. Segmentation. I mean, if you get to a cybersecurity conference in the Netherlands and you get out of there without hearing zero trust network architecture, I'm not sure you were listening. Um, this is the 100% flavor of the month in our industry, and it's highly suggested to follow it. It's the Titanic model of you get breached in one area of the network and then go down anyway because they sold you something that doesn't work. No, I'm joking. That was the Titanic. That's not zero trust network architecture. Um, you need to break up as much of the network as possible and don't make silly mistakes like putting a jump box between two areas of the network and then having the domain admins go in there anyway. What's the point? You can grab it and then jump. Protect accounts. Um, I think the key point here is that MFA is no longer the silver bullet that it has been marketed. And we would highly suggest looking at things like privilege access management, being given admin roles for 15 minutes to do a specific task, and then those admin roles are revoked. There's some great technology out there. Um, and the other point is, is, of course, this MFA issue. What to do in the face of MFA bypasses is really considering whether you need password authentication at all and whether you can move to things like Microsoft Hello or Windows Hello or hardware tokens like YubiKeys. I'm a big, big, big fan of hardware-based uh, authentication. Almost finished. I know everyone wants to go for a beer. So uh, high impact cyber attacks are increasing. Do not look at anything in the news about you know, law enforcement takedowns. It's the, you know, the world's changing. We're making progress. No, we're not. We're losing the war in the digital space, and that's a fact at the moment. Hopefully not in five years, and then uh, my job can be less secure. The dominant adversary is still financially motivated threat actors from the Russia slash former Commonwealth, what's it, Commonwealth of Independent States, China, North Korea, and Iran. The amount of activity we are seeing from Iranian-based actors at the moment 
are united by the Gaza-Israel conflict. Unbelievable. Attacks are still basically ransomware and business email compromise. Um, living off the land binaries, they are getting a lot smarter with the use of malware. What is and what isn't malware? Malicious use of legitimate tools. So having visibility and a baseline of understanding of what's normal in your environment is, is absolutely key. The amount of clients we go in and go, so what remote access software do you use? And they say, TeamViewer and AnyDesk. I'm like, fantastic. So why is Splashtop on all of your servers? Oh yeah, we use Splashtop. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so why is ConnectWise on there? Oh yeah, they, we used that in 2019 for uh, at the beginning of COVID. Okay, so we now have four remote access tools, a VPN, okay, right. And you've got a third party vendor who does web server administration. Oh, okay, right. You'd be surprised how many clients of a massive size have such a poor understanding of, of, of what legitimate tools they have and the vulnerability this presents. Last two, everyone thinks they're being targeted. Everyone thinks, oh, there is a Russian out there who really wants my credit card data. They don't care about your credit card. What they are doing, though, is scanning the entire internet and hoping that they find the weak gazelle that's on the edge of the hood, and they will go for that one. So make sure you are not a weak gazelle. And then the last point is, our industry is throwing words and technology at you and telling you that you need to do 150 million things at once. I think the message that often comes from our advisory team, people at Gideon over there, is that you need to focus on critical junctures that are accelerants, that are enablers. There are specific moments in the attack chain that if you focus your defenses on, you can cripple the incident before it gets to actions on objectives. You're not gonna be able to stop everyone and you should assume the breach, but if you make a couple of key investments, you can significantly reduce your risk. And that is the last key takeaway, I think. So way over time, but thank you very much for your, uh, for your attendance and engagement. Thank you.